everyone, welcome to the Sweeney Show, Business and Law Podcast. My name is David Sweeney, and joining me here today is Graeme Kenny, solicitor and owner of Kenny Solicitors. Graeme, you're very welcome. Hi, how are you? Thank you for asking me. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, how have you been coping yourself personally in your firm during the COVID-19 and the changes we've all had to make? Uh, well, we've adjusted, I suppose, quite well. I'm, I'm enjoying, I think, the, the, the work from home and kind of more time uh, to myself. Our particular firm is, I suppose, unusual in the sense that uh, we practice a lot in insolvency. So for that reason, we've taken in a lot of queries and we're, I suppose, more busy at this time than the average firm based on the, the, the kind of more traditional uh, legal areas that law firms deal with. And your, um, can I just take you back? And I'd really like to get into that insolvency and especially the examinership uh, type area in a couple of minutes. Your legal training, you, you an undergraduate in law, is law in your family or how did you come about to be, no. to have a career as a solicitor? <laughs> yeah, no, there's no, uh, no law whatsoever. I think I've watched too many television series as a teenager or something. So, no, I am. Um, Ali McBeal, was it? Yes, pretty much. Yeah, I, I I went to UCD and that kind of passed me by. I, I did my leaving certificate quite young, so I was in UCD at sixteen, seventeen, and I was. It sounds good, but I found quite a bad experience. I was finished um, nineteen, turned twenty, and I, I suppose that that whole college experience passed me by because it was such a big cultural shift for me. Um, I had qualified almost immediately then in New York. I did the bar exams effectively from my bedroom in Dublin, flew over to Manhattan, did the exams there. Um, I trained at the time in a solicitor's Noel Smith and Partners mm -hmm. who were doing the Moriarty Tribunal. They were Ben Dunn's lawyer. So that was a particularly sexy firm that was on the news. So I applied to them, took that up. And then I, uh, after my apprenticeship, I wanted to kind of go into one of the larger firms so i went into matheson's um, and stayed there for a number of years doing exclusively corporate finance work yeah and i i, I read a bit about uh, there's an article you, you you gave a couple of years ago that when you were 32 then in around you you went out on your own did you merge five firms together yeah no i think i think it was long before i was 32 okay. actually i did a number of years in madison's and then no but i, I can't remember that i'd say by the time i was 26 or 27 um i joined uh, another great guy Barry Lyons and we created a partnership together and we took over about five firms and joined them together during that time so we had a fairly accelerated rise um, that for that partnership ran very successfully for over a decade and um, uh, concurrently with that we become I suppose property investors and we invest very heavily we uh, started a company Fitzwilliam Land Securities that uh, had land holdings pretty much all over Dublin, certain parts of Ireland, and that exploded. So we were able to leverage sites that we had in that to kind of make investments ultimately around the world from Los Angeles to Asia. Um, so we kind of became entrepreneurial solicitors in that we were treating the law firm with a different expansion rate, uh, certainly than the, the most law firms. Now, ultimately, I became a victim of my own success in that. I, I developed eight-figure debt, which I suppose back in 2007 you can imagine how well uh, property holdings were going so we you know i felt i was kind of a rock star for a number of years leading into that and that kind of shook that the, the after 2007 the whole property side rattled and every law firm in the country then had to rationalize and trim down and um, so there was a number of years of dealing with um kind of lotto number debt uh ultimately that resolved uh, in the high court with I think five banks and a lo long protracted period of mediation so we had certainly myself I had the shackles of debt running alongside the law firm for a number of years which was kind of ironic because our one of our primary areas was uh, that of insolvency and commercial litigation so I would have acted for the majority of the well-known developers and that throughout the country at that time um, would have done, uh, again, ironically, some works for banks because we developed expertise in particular areas and became very well known for um, areas such as examinership and that. So ironically, in dealing with my own uh, debt, it was more than a, a good training ground for what my clients were experiencing at that time because the whole world just fell off a cliff around those years. And Can I, ju can I just ask you there, because 26, 27 is quite young. I, I'm actually in business 10 years on my own this year. I'm 42, so I was 32 and I started off in bang in the middle of the recession as well. But what, 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 what is your ambition or drives you? How, do you? how do you have so much drive and motivation to set up so young and to keep going now? 
Well, I, I don't. I don't know whether I'm particularly unique in that. But when I went into, I suppose there was a there was a disconnect between my perception and reality of what law was, and I think that's very prevalent amongst a lot of lawyers. So I went to do a large law firm. Um, I was doing uh, these corporate finance deals for massive technology companies, and it, I quickly realised that what my perception of law was, which was that of what I'd seen on American television shows as I sat in this room on my own drafting warranty clauses for 14, 15 hours a day, getting back up and coming in the following day. I suppose my eureka moment was we completed a, a particularly large deal for these um, US investors. And there was champagne and all the rest broken out at completion in the boardroom. And then the next day I went in and the, the partner I was working for handed me another uh, share purchase agreements to read through. And I went, Start again. I want to be the Repeat. host guys. <laughs> I, you know, this, this, is, this isn't what I signed up for at all. This was, this was what I was thinking. And I always had somewhat of an entrepreneurial kind of spirit. Even during that time, I was looking at various matters. I suppose property was like every Irish person. I was infected with the property bug around that time. So I was looking into how finance worked how uh, banks lent money um, from that, as I say, when we took over what was Dublin Land Securities and converted it into Fitzwilliam Land Securities, that allowed it, that catapulted us up into leveraging debt, which was a fantastic thing at the time because it allowed us to acquire all these firms and it gave us the working capital and cash flow to get into every exciting business under the sun. Um, even down to acquiring part of a, 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 a law firm, ironically, in, in Washington, one of their main buildings. So we, we were able to kind of at our discretion get involved in pretty much anything. I was at the point where I suppose, you know, if I, if I could turn back the clock, um, that's the time you kind of hit bank and I could have retired and uh, my family's family could have retired. But like everybody else, we got caught, caught up in that roller coaster and, and the, the merry-go-rounds stopped and uh, we hadn't got off at that time. So I was running, I suppose, that dual mindset of running what was a, a very successful law firm um, with rapid expansion plans coupled with um, all of these other business interests. And the world just stopped. 2000, 2007, I can remember clients coming in with rumours that Anglo Bank uh, was going to stop lending money. And then one day that bank collapsed. Ironically, um, I ended up... Uh, in, the, in recent years, representing members of the board of Quinn. So I got an insight, I suppose. So it was kind of a full circle. Um, that particular case was the largest case, I think, ever to come before the high court in, in the region of 3 billion euros. So I went from being on the outside of uh, feeling the effects of those type of collapses to, I suppose, a, yeah, an inner view on, on you know, mm. what the board workings were at that time when it went down. So it was an interesting decade, to, to, to say the least. And I suppose the flip side of then drive and ambition and passion is uh, the stress. How did you cope personally with the stress? Because obviously you're running a business law practice and then you have your property interests. When that stuff was, the difficulties were there, how did you cope with that personally? Terribly badly, like everybody else. And you hear, I suppose you'll hear all these great speeches and I look on these YouTube clips of people and you know, you get out and you go for your run and you have guys like David Goldman shouting at themselves and you know, this is how you go. I, I, I dealt with it by putting my, my hands in my face on my sofa and crying probably. That that's how I dealt with it. And I think that's how most people deal with it. Yeah. Um, I was I was talking to people during the week about, you know, in essence what was the toolbox to get through those because that incredibly difficult time because a lot of my clients and certainly a lot of uh, the businesses that I'm consulting at the moment, they're in deep crisis mode. And there seems to be this mythical perception that there's a magic wand or, you know, there's you know, this business of kind of the secret and your vibrations out to the universe and in some way uh, the, the world gets better for you. That, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in my experience. The one thing I would say is the elapse of time gives you different pieces of the jigsaw to complete the picture. So um, as time elapses, other, uh, so yeah, the simple elapse of time allows if you can stay on the horse long enough, kind of the, mm. the simple lapse of time allows you uh, more options and getting good advice from proper professionals, expanding your network into that area during that crisis mode and not being alone and dealing with people at that time. But the one critical feature I would say that I've seen amongst my clients over the past decade, do not bury your head in the sand because you've wondered the only way as, as difficult as it is and as cliched as it sounds is facing the problem. Mm. 
Yeah, I actually, I read a quote you had there. Uh, you did an article a couple of years ago. It's, real success is not necessarily the guy who makes the most money or has a private jet, but the guy who takes the right decisions when things go wrong and comes through it in the end. Yeah, because, I mean, I have an awful lot of extremely wealthy clients, and quite a number of them who are, you know, high profile and otherwise have, a, have uh, jets and all of the other trinkets of success. That, to my mind, obviously, it's very... Uh, very impressive tangible wealth but it's not impressive entrepreneurial spirit spirit mm. and i've said this a number of times I, I don't really want to meet the guy who's made hundreds of millions and hasn't had an issue i don't believe you make hundreds of millions and haven't had an issue but i have clients who've made uh, hundreds of millions without being arrogant i'm not learning a whole lot from them the guy that i'm learning from is the guy who to be blunt has fallen on his arse um there'll be a lot of business owners uh, coming out of this upcoming recession if we're not already in one and the, the real skill set and the real measure of the person, I think, is dealing with them. And whether that's a small coffee shop owner who's trying to expand or otherwise, that's what's impressive. Yeah, dealing with creditors, getting your sleep in, being able to keep your headspace, learning to be comfortable in, in extremely uncomfortable environments, that's what's impressive. Anyone, uh, and, and, and I've had the heights of the height. I remember back to 2006 and walking in and being invited to every horse race meeting by bank and they were buying, you know, extending me credit to buy the most extravagant cars and all the rest at that time. That's easy. That's easy. When you're on top, it's easy to give the, the interviews and the business advice. What's difficult is when it's all gone wrong, when it's crumbling around you and you keep your head, I consider it. That's what's incredibly impressive. And that's what people don't talk about. If you see any of these kind of, for want of a better description, entrepreneurial uh whether it's YouTube or something else, nonsensical like that, where they're giving advice, they're all fist bumping and this is how you trade and this is how you do things. There's nobody there sitting, explaining the process of this is how it went incredibly wrong for me and these are the mechanical steps of how I worked my way out of that. And that's all I want to hear about. Mm. That, that actually takes us nicely into your speciality because I want to get into talking about examinership. So examinership seems to be that light of the tunnel or that extra leg up a company in trouble might need. Um, what's the difference? Because we always hear about liquidation, you know, people, companies forced into liquidation, whether it's by creditors, voluntary and voluntary and receiverships. Where, where does the, the role of the examiner, how is, when do you decide examiner is the right option, examinership is the right option for my company? Well, I suppose the first question to ask is, is your company solvent? And for a lot of companies now uh, who cannot pay the, their debts as they fall due, they are therefore ranked insolvent. And examinership, it, to my mind, is a hugely underutilized feature, and it gets a, an awful lot of bad press, largely from vested interests, I should say, such as banks and that, who don't want necessarily to take up the, the, the reins of, of the examinership. So very briefly, when a company becomes insolvent, it has several, uh, it's, it has several options. A creditor uh, with a fixed charge, so in simple terms, that's ordinarily a bank, they can appoint a receiver and effectively take over your business or, uh, and, and run it. The director of, of that company can determine at that point, uh, prior to receivership or otherwise, um, to put the company into liquidation. So the company is insolvent. The only rescue method uh, that, in, to my mind, works, and there's a number of what's called voluntary schemes, with creditors that you can put together. The reason I find they don't work under the Companies Act is um, their threshold, such as 75% in value um, of creditors, generally that's either the revenue commissioners um, or a bank. And they don't, for want of a better description, play ball uh, when you're in those debts. They'll come up with every excuse. They'll come up with rolling the debts forward. We put your overdraft into a term loan and all the rest. So you're not, banks don't want to write off debt. It's not in their DNA. And the revenue commission is, to a large extent, prohibited from doing so. So you're allowed to trade on, on this with this kind of deadening lifeline of debt following. So the only way that you can cut free of that debt is the examination process. And that could be an application now to the circuit court or for larger companies uh, to the high court. And I, I believe it will be a hugely utilized tool going forward for struggling companies. Essentially, an examiner who's an independent party and uh, officer of the court will go in, complete a report. The attraction um, 
to directors is they continue with their executive powers. So they continue to trade on in tandem with, with the examiner. And the examiner compiles a report, reports to the court, and ultimately attracts investment into the company. And the real difference and the real sword that an examinership can bring to any uh, struggling company is it can force a write down to even an uncooperating creditor. So in the event, uh, the, in the event that you can demonstrate that they would effectively fare no better during a liquidation, you can write down their debt. And as simple as that sounds, you, I'm sure there'll be a lot of directors listening uh, to this who will, who will agree, landlords and uh, other demanding creditors, they won't accept the reality that the, mother, that the money is not there. Even if you tell them, look, I'm about to go into liquidation, they will not accept that. So in order to save jobs, give the company a realistic opportunity of trading successfully into the future, you don't want rolled up debt, interest, forbearance, or something else, or even the headspace of dealing with creditors at this time. You want to guillotine, slice off the, the, the historical debt. And the only method that I find that works uh, is examinership because it's objective as a judge who can force that right down on those creditors. And when you go to court and you're successful in having an examiner uh, appointed, what kind of time frame do you get? What, do you get much breeding space to kind of sort out you the get company? You get ultimately 100 days. Um, there are three, uh, I think, points of report effectively to the court. So I think the first period is 35 days, the second is 70 days, and, and the final period is 100. Those days are not a given. So after 35 days, the examiner must go back and say, this is the progress we've made. We've engaged with these creditors. This is how we're doing. I think there is a reasonable prospect of survival to, uh, uh, to continue on. Before you go into the examinership process, you have to have what's called an independent accountant report. Uh, carried out uh, on your company to prove effectively that the company has a reasonable prospect of survival. So there's a various kind of reporting, you ultimately have 100 days in the event you get into examinership, and there's a various uh, stop points at which you must report to the court during that time. And is it hoped then within that 100 days that the, the company then is back on track and can trade itself out of it? Uh, practically every examinership I have done, and I'm hoping to complete this week the first high court examinership during COVID-19, um, all, practically every company uh, comes out. I saw uh, comes out and trades successfully. I, I saw a statistic. I think around 2017, I think it was the last uh, report done that showed something like 60% of companies that had gone into examinership. I think it was from 2007 were, were continuing to trade. So it's a highly successful uh, uh, method uh, for restructuring companies. And why do you think so? It's, if that is the success rate, it's, it seems to be so utilised or so le or less known than the well, other methods. It's a, it's, a, it's a niche area, and there's no doubt about that. And like I said, the vested interests, why would a bank who could appoint a receiver uh, consider, albeit that it might be in their interests, it's not necessarily in their DNA to cede control to an independent party who's, who's not them to oversee events. The examiner can trump the receiver and stop him acting. During that 100 days, uh, companies are insulated from litigation. They cannot be wound up. And the receiver uh, uh, is restricted in his actions. And the receiver is generally the bank's man, for want of a better description. So the larger bodies of restructuring, um, they have no interest necessarily in giving over control to an indep independent party because they're losing their negotiating positions. And historically, liquidations, receiverships, um, they have been, I suppose, what has trotted out at, at, a, at every insolvent moment. And that's why I'm really trying to push uh, and, and scream to directors coming out of the, uh, this, hopefully, recession, uh, that there are options available, that your company can be restructured, restructured, that the courts will give you protection, that the courts will force write-downs in particular circumstances to allow them to consider the plethora of options as opposed to... Uh, going into their bank, sitting there and listening to it, being dictated to effectively. Graeme, listen, thank you so much for your time today. That was really interesting and informative uh, discussion. Um, just ask yourself personally, your plans for the future and for the business. Where do you think we're going outside this COVID-19? Um, well, our own business, I'm hoping to, uh, we, we uh, expansion plans. I suppose we're all subject to the pandemic. I'm looking at opening up a New York office, hopefully in the next uh, 12 months. And for businesses going forward, I think it's going to be a difficult time for everybody. And it's just a matter of seeking the right advice from the correct professionals uh, at the right time. And if there was a young solicitor, maybe a law graduate out there now thinking of a career in law, uh, would you recommend it or what advice would you give to them? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, being a solicitor is one of the most malleable careers possible. What I would say is um, 
find out the area of law that you're interested in. It's like uh, not not unlike medicine. There's a, there's a broad church of different areas. And um, so you know, for me, I don't particularly like conveyancing. There's people uh, in my office and. and that's what they live for. They're delighted to sit and read through title all day and they find it fascinating. Um, I find it boring. So it, 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 it depends It depends on your particular personality type, what you're good, what you're bad at. So to assess uh, who you are and apply yourself to that that particular field in law so you don't get streamlined uh, in something that you, you, you don't, you're you not particularly suited to for a lifetime. Graham, that's great advice. Listen, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and we sincerely all wish you all the very best for the future. Thank you very much, David. Thank you.